Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We want to welcome you today to Palm Sunday, 2020. And uh, my name is Mark Gagline, and I'm the transitional interim pastor here at Silver Creek Church of God. And we want to welcome you to our online worship service this morning. We hope that it will encourage you and inspire you uh, to follow Jesus. I want to read to you this morning uh, to get us started from Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is where Isaac Watts wrote, Joy to the World. Psalm 96 says this. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared among all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let the heavens be glad and rejoice in it. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let us pray. Father, we give you this service today for your glory. Um, we want your name to be lifted up and glorified this morning. We want to worship you this morning as our King of kings and Lord of lords. We invite your Holy Spirit to be here to worship you. We love you and we thank you for the provision of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that your Holy Spirit We'll just encourage and strengthen our hearts today. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Silver Creek. It is so wonderful to be with you again. I hope you are all staying healthy and staying encouraged in your hearts. As we turn our thoughts toward the Lord this morning, we are going to sing together, Oh, Worship the King and Hosanna and also Living Hope. So I encourage you right where you are to sing along with me.
thank you, Gilletta, for leading us in worship again this Sunday. I would encourage you to uh, send uh, Gilletta some thank yous and some encouraging notes for her taking her time uh, to bless us through the gift of song. I want to read this morning from Matthew 21, and it's going to be our scripture for today. Um, we're going to be looking in John 11 a little bit later. But Matthew 21 says this. It says, Now when they came near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent the two disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of the beast of the burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put him on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him, that followed him, were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem, and the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. May the Lord bless the reading of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem from Matthew 21. Today we want to uh, go to prayer, and I'm going to give us a list of seven things that we can be praying for. And earlier this week, I sent out from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, where I attended school, a prayer list for 30 days that we can be praying during this pandemic. And I would just want to list the things I want to pray for today. And I also would encourage you, um, we're going to be trying to get our prayer list out for family and friends of Silver Creek, that you can be praying for them as well. But I would encourage you uh, to be praying, praying for our country and praying for this pandemic. Um, here is seven days worth of prayers that I'm going to pray for us in just a little bit. The first one is for God's name to be glorified or magnified. Second, praying for healing and comfort for the sick. Third, we're going to pray for supplies and stamina for healthcare workers. Fourth, we want to pray for insight for the researchers and scientists. Fifth, we want to pray for wisdom and insight for our spiritual leaders. And six, we want to pray for protection and strength for those who have been affected um, with the coronavirus. And seven, we want to pray for safekeeping for the abuse. Like I said, there's many things we can be praying for. And if you just want to even pause this video or pause the message that we're given um, beforehand, just to, to pray. Um, but I'm going to pray for us right now. Let us pray. Father, we pray that your name will be glorified and magnified. And in the midst of this pandemic that is worldwide, I pray, dear Lord, that you just will lift up your name and be glorified. We just uh, think of Palm Sunday when the crowds cried out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so we want your name to be blessed. We pray, dear Lord, for healing and for comfort for those who are sick. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will heal and comfort, um, especially those who, who don't have the virus, but who are maybe scared to, to go to the doctor or the hospital and seek the proper medical advice that they need. I pray, dear Lord, though, for those who do have the virus, that you will um, make sure that they get the proper medication and equipment that they need. We pray, dear Lord, for the supplies and the stamina for our healthcare workers. And we praise you, dear Lord, for those on the front line. And we pray, dear Lord, a special protection for doctors and hospital workers and nurses. And just go before them, give them strength, give them wisdom, give them courage. But most of all, protect them from the virus. 
And I pray, dear Lord, as our country is working hard for masks and ventilators and breathing machines, I pray, dear Lord, that we will get these supplies now. And we just pray for continued testing so that we can know who has the virus. Keep us safe. I pray, dear Lord, for insight for those who are working on a cure. I pray for researchers and scientists. I pray, dear Lord, that you will allow us to come up with a, a cure. I pray, dear Lord, for wisdom and humility for our spiritual leaders. I pray, dear Lord, that, uh, that we as pastors and we as the church and we as elders and leaders in the church, I pray, dear Lord, that you will just give us the incredible wisdom to know how we can be the church. And as we've been learning, the church is not a building. It's not somewhere we meet just on Sunday. It's something that we do throughout the week, 24-7. And I pray, dear Lord, that we as a church can do your will and glorify your name. I pray, dear Lord, for protection and strength um, for those who have low um, immune systems. I pray, dear Lord, that you will protect them um, from getting compromised and uh, getting the virus. And I just pray, dear Lord, for those who have to stay at home and maybe it's in a bad situation that's not safe. We know we want every home to be safe. But I pray, dear Lord, I, I just pray for our homes right now. Keep everybody safe and protect them. Protect them from parental abuse, child abuse, um, sexual abuse. Uh, just keep us safe, dear Lord, when everybody has to stay at home. And most of all, dear Lord, I want to pray for our church family today. You know those who are sick and are hurting and lonely, those in the nursing homes. I pray, dear Lord, that you just will go before them. I pray, dear Lord, that you continue to be with um, Pastor Jim Martin's uh, family um, in their time of grieving and uh, just uh, be with Carolyn, be with uh, their daughter Sue and be with the grandchildren and great grandchildren. Just encourage them and strengthen them during this difficult time. We give you the rest of this service and we pray that your name will be glorified. In Jesus name. Amen. This morning, we want to also uh, worship through giving, and for some of you, this is a strange time, and you're used to bringing your offering to church. I would encourage you to mail your, your offering in, and many of you are doing that, and so you can just uh, send it to Silver Creek Church of God. And I would also encourage you, um, you can also think of ways to do direct deposit if you'd like to do that, and uh, be sure to, to talk to us, but we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to worship the Lord in giving. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says in chapter 16, he says that, that we are to set aside an income according to what we make um, so that a collection will not need to be taken. And as we go through this very difficult time, may we continue to be faithful in our giving, and may we give for the glory of God. Let us pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for the offering. We thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to worship you through giving. And I pray, dear Lord, that we as a church can be the church in these very difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen.
such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior Let's pray and ask that God will just speak to us today uh, through this morning's message. Uh, Father, we thank you for the word of God. And as I like to often pray, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. I pray, dear Lord, by the, the power of your Holy Spirit through the word of God, that you will speak and encourage and challenge us uh, to place our faith in you and to trust you today. And I pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we want to walk through the weekend before Easter weekend. And some of us don't realize this, but on Friday is when probably Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. On Saturday is when Mary anointed Jesus' feet. And Sunday is the Palm Sunday when Jesus went into Jerusalem. And we want to look at this weekend and see how it applies to us. And I think with what we're going through in these uncertain times, in these unchartered waters, as we face a life with uncertainty and fear and confusion and messiness, I can think of no better story than the story of Lazarus. You see, God is a God who often surprises us. And what we have planned for the future is way different than God has planned. And too many of us have a safe God. And our God, as I've learned, isn't often safe. He's a God who loves us, who cares about us, but he's never overly promised us safety. He will save us, but too often we are trusting in God to protect us when he wants to teach us something about who he is and he wants to glorify us. I want to start off, though, by asking you three questions. The first question is this. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? I'm not talking about John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. 
in a generic fashion, but do you believe that Jesus loves you? Loves you today in the midst of your pain and your brokenness, in the midst of your confusion. Do you believe that Jesus is in radical and reckless love for you? Do you believe this? The second question I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Uh, do you do believe that Jesus is in control, that he is sovereign, that he is good? And is he not just Lord of this world, but is he your Lord? Is he your number one God that you are trusting in today? Are you putting your faith in him? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is not just your Savior, but he is your Lord? And you're putting your life and your concerns and your cares in his hands. And the last question, do you believe that Jesus is a source of life? Not just eternal life, not just everlasting life, not just life after heaven, but do you believe that Jesus is the source of life today in the midst of being stuck at home with these stay-at-home orders, in this, in this confusion of life? Do you believe that Jesus is the source of life, abundant life? Well, let us start in John chapter 11. And so if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to John chapter 11 so you can follow along. There's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, and then there's John in the New Testament. And um, no reason to be embarrassed. Just if you don't know where John is, look in the concordance. John chapter 11. Now the gospel of John was written for a specific purpose, that we who were reading the stories in John we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing, we would have life, eternal life, everlasting life, abundant life in Jesus Christ. It was written so that we would believe in Jesus Christ. There is seven I am statements. For example, we're going to see one of them. I am the resurrection and the life. And it also has not only seven I am statements, but the Gospel of John also has seven signs or seven miracles. And we're going to look at one of those today as well with the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. So here's where I'd like to begin. I want to begin just in the verses below so we can get a little context. In John chapter 10, verse 40, it says that Jesus went away again across the Jordan. So he's across the Jordan River. So he's a little ways from Bethany. And he, it says he was across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. And many came to him. They said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in Jesus there. So let's get the context. Many are starting to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the one that the Old Testament talked about, which would bring salvation for the Jewish nation. He would be the one that would free people from their sins and from slavery and captivity in the Roman world. And he was going to establish his kingdom. And many were starting to believe in Jesus Christ. At the same time, the Jewish leaders were fearful and afraid that maybe Jesus Christ was going to establish his kingdom. And they, the Jewish leaders, said no way could Jesus be the Son of God. So here's where the story picks up. And again, this is the Friday before Good Friday. It says, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. And so we're going to read about this in the next chapter over, but uh, John wants to tell us something special about Mary. And Mary and Martha weren't just two sisters. They were special sisters. Notice what it says. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Some of you maybe have heard there's different words uh, for the Greek language for the word love. And this word is more of a friendship love, phileo love. 
the one that you love, the one that you're good friends with, the one that you, you care about, your companion, your friend, um, someone who you consider very close is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Let me stop here. God, like I said in the beginning, often surprises us. We would think, oh, this is Jesus's best friend. This is somebody Jesus is close to. This is someone that Jesus loves and cares about. Jesus is going to drop everything, or Jesus is just going to give the command, and Lazarus is going to be healed. Right now, we are in a very serious situation in the United States and throughout the world. Many of us are fearful, and we're scared, and we're starting to pray. Some of you are praying for the very first time. And I want to, to notice something in this passage. Mary and Martha, they send a report. And many of us do this in our prayer lives. We give a report. God, I just lost my job. Uh, God, a family member has a coronavirus. God, I, I, I'm scared. I'm afraid. And what I believe that Jesus is trying to teach us here is that he doesn't want a report. Jesus already knew about his friend Lazarus. Obviously, he was the son of God. But he wants us to cry out to him. He wants us to give him a request. So Mary and Martha should have said, Lord, heal Lazarus. Rescue Lazarus. He, not just give a report. Lord, come to his rescue at this very moment. But notice here what Jesus does. And a lot of us are very confused what's happening right now. Why, why this medical crisis? Why this political crisis? Why is the news media acting like they're against us instead of for us? Why are we losing our jobs? Why is the Dow Jones tanking? Why? What's going on? But notice what Jesus is saying. He says, it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified. Now, I don't believe personally that he's talking about raising Lazarus from the dead. I think he's talking about his own death and resurrection and the glory that was to come. You see, everything is sort of a stepping stone to the glory of God. And what is going on in this pandemic and maybe what's going on with your job, maybe what's going on with your in, in education, with your students, what, what's going on maybe with um, some other difficulties, maybe with your health, anything that's going on right now. It's a stepping stone to the glory of God. And we're about ready to celebrate next week, Easter, the resurrection, which is the turning point for all of Christianity. And so Jesus says it is for the glory of God. So when you start having your doubts and your confusions, know that God has a purpose, and his purpose is that he will be glorified. Now, I asked you in the beginning, do you believe that Jesus loves you? And I think John wants to tell us from the get-go that Jesus has deep love for us. And it says in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. John moves away from the word that is a friendship love to this unconditional love. And maybe you've heard the word agape before. It's God's love for us that is sacrificial. It's a covenant love. It's a passionate love. It's a committed, unconditional love. And God had that for Mary and for Martha and the sister, or and for Lazarus. May we never get confused in this chaos and this messiness. God loves us. God loves us, Jesus Christ loves us, and the Holy Spirit loves us. Even if we haven't yet placed our faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to know that God loves you. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love in this way while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, may we never, ever get confused that we are God's beloved. We are his sons and daughters, and he loves us very much. I want to pick up the story 
as you know, Jesus delays and then Jesus stays an extra two days, which is very confusing. Why is he doing this? And then it's very interesting. The story changes a little bit in verse 12. So Jesus says, Lord, or the disciples say to, to Jesus, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. It was very interesting. This is the word for saved. He will be saved. He'll be delivered. He'll be rescued. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant he was taking a rest in his sleep because Jesus said he was just asleep and there was nothing to be worried about. But Jesus actually was talking about his death. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, notice this. It almost sounds like God is a little bit, Jesus is a little bit sick or crazy here. But notice he says, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to the fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Oh, there is so much in this story. But the one thing that I want you to see is that the reason for the delay, the delete, reason for the pause, the reason for the unanswered prayer, even though it was just a report, was so that the disciples may believe. Now, if you have read the Gospel of John before, you realize in John chapter 2, they first believed in Jesus Christ after the, the first sign of Jesus turning water into wine. But you will notice that the disciples' faith progresses and grows and develops. And it is true for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Some of you have believed in Jesus Christ, but your faith is still very weak and insufficient. And what God wants to do sometimes when he's trying to teach us patience, when he's trying to teach us surrender, when he's trying to teach us to wait, is he wants us to believe in him. He not just wants to grow our faith, but he wants to develop and strengthen our faith that we will have faith even in the midst of tough times. And we're in tough times. And I think the story of Lazarus just speaks to us today that we need to trust him even when we do not understand what is going on. All the disciples knew is that they were going to Jerusalem and they were probably going to die with Jesus because the Jewish leaders wanted to crucify and to kill Jesus. And they knew that they were going to go there and they were going to die with him. They didn't even understand, but they were going to have their faith strengthen. Now notice in verse 18, it says Bethany, where Lazarus' home was, was near Jerusalem about two miles off. So not only does God surprise us sometimes with delaying and not answering our prayers right away, but God now surprises us as Jesus goes into the danger zone. And I want to say, some of you feel like we're in the danger zone right now. Jesus went into the danger zone a week before Good Friday, a week before his crucifixion. Jesus goes into the danger zone. And the reason he goes into the danger zone is he wants to give us life. In verse 21, it says that Martha was the first to reach Jesus. And she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. How many times have you said that? God, if only, if only you'd been here, if only your power was greater, if only you were more present, if you were only more real, if you were only more visible, if, you, if I could only see you work, then, then something great would happen. But what I love in the midst of this doubt, there is still a very strong faith. She has faith in God. She has faith in Christ. She has faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what she says, but even now, even now, I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She still believes that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the midst of doubts and delays and confusion and surprises and her brother dying, she still believes that Jesus is Lord and has a son of God relationship with the Heavenly Father. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice Jesus' words affirming, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming back into the world. Notice the affirmation of her faith. Yes, Lord, I believe. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday, on Easter Sunday, our affirmation of saying, yes, Lord, I believe. But I want to highlight Jesus being the resurrection and the life. And this is something I think many of us have not really considered. We all know that we're going to die physically. And everybody was concerned that Lazarus was going to die physically and that there would be maybe a resurrection someday of his body. But Jesus was saying, no, that there was life after death. There was going to be a resurrected life after death. But throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus has also been talking about a second type of life, abundant life, a resurrected life, eternal life, which is a quality of life that we have now as believers in Christ. So if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you you live now. Most of us, we still have our grave clothes on. We're not living the life that God has called us to live. And then there is the third. There is going to be the resurrection of the dead. You read about it in Revelation 20, 21, 22, the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the eternal life that Jesus Christ is coming to bring. But for us here today, especially for us as believers, are you living the resurrection life? You see, if you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are in a relationship with the resurrection and the life. And you need to trust him. And many of us know how the story goes. Martha leaves and gets Mary. And then Mary falls at Jesus' feet. And she says the same thing that Martha said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Notice, though, in verse 33, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews even said, see how he loved you. I want to get back to that question. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? You know, Jesus wept, not just because Lazarus had died, not just because he was feeling sorry for Mary and Martha. Jesus wept because this was not the play, (laughs) the, the way that God had planned it. This is not the story. And the story that many of us are living with heartbrokenness and and just pain and agony and suffering and difficulties, that is not the way it is meant to be. Jesus came that we might have life. And it's not only saying that Jesus wept, that he just had a little tear in his eye. He was angry. He was distraught. He He was furious because God is about life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, there is a thief. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy life. But Jesus came that we might have life, and we might have it more abundantly. Next week, we're going to look at Lazarus coming out. But I just want you this week to think about the life in Jesus Christ. Are you, as a believer, still walking around in grave clothes? And I want you to think seriously, and I want you to personalize this. So for me, Mark, come out. I want you to put your own name there. It says, Lazarus, come out. He says he said it in a loud voice, a voice of triumph, a voice of victory. And the victory is ours. And again, we're going to celebrate this next week on Easter Sunday. But over the course of the next seven days, think about Jesus and think about the story of Lazarus and think about the question. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? But do you believe, do you believe that Jesus wants to give you life here today? 
on Saturday before Resurrection Sunday, it says in John chapter 12, it says six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead the day before. And so they gave him a dinner there and Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now, this is something that I want us to think about this weekend. And I know Saturday has already passed, but notice in verse three, it says, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment uh, made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And here's what I just want to think about. In the midst of of this messiness, of this confusion, on on the doorsteps of death and crucifixion, in the midst of her brokenness and her pain, and I know she was glad and she was excited that Jesus finally came through the (laughs) rescue and Lazarus was right there reclining at the table with Jesus. So in high times and low times, she worshiped. And her worship was expensive. Her worship was costly. She she, she used fragrant offering. And, And we will, if you read the story, you notice Judas was upset because of the cost. And he didn't care about the poor. He was a thief himself. The disciples, he stole from the disciples. But what I wanted you to think about, are you able to worship Jesus today? You know, when Job lost everything, Job tore his clothes and was naked and bowed down. And he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. Mary, in her worship, was doing something that many didn't understand. She was foreshadowing our worship in heaven. And when you worship Jesus now, you foreshadow our worship in heaven. And she even was foreshadowing, I even meant to say, the crucifixion and his death and his burial and his resurrection. She was anointing him for burial. And when we trust God, we we are, are trusting him and we're foreshadowing our faith that God is at work and that God is for us and not against us. And that leads up to today, Palm Sunday. Now we learn in the story that the the chief priest, the high priest, and the Jewish leaders were out to, to kill not only Jesus. Get this, this is how sick it was and how messy and confusing it was. In, in verse 10 of chapter 12, it says, So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because of the account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. We live in a crazy world, and I know some of you are you're anti the news and call it the fake news, or you think that one party is against you and one party is for you. Notice this. They, they want to get Lazarus because he, he was doing good <laughs> for his Savior and the Lord, Jesus Christ. They wanted to kill him. But even though the leaders wanted to kill Jesus, there was many who understood who Jesus was. And they wanted to worship him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the Almighty God. So notice what it says. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, which literally means save us now. They cried out, save us, deliver us, rescue us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Verse 16 says, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and what had been done. 
to him. You know, most of Palm Sunday is based upon Psalm 118. Psalm 118, um, in the middle, towards the end of it, Psalm 118, it says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And then it cries out, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Today, I want us, especially as believers in Christ, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior and as your King, as we've been learning through our daily devotions, if you you understand him as your shepherd who cares for you and protects you, you may not understand what's going on. You may not understand why the pandemic, pandemic, why we've lost our jobs, maybe why the economy is tanking, why this is happening now. And you may have a lot of questions. Is is this the end times? Is this the end of the world? Am I going to live through this? Well, I have a story to tell my grandchildren. Got a lot of questions, a lot of misunderstanding. But one thing is sure. You see, If you go back and you read Psalm 118, it's a psalm of praise and thanksgiving because Jesus Christ, his steadfast love and his mercy is constant. His love endures forever. Go back and read John 11, John chapter 12. And answer this question. Do you believe that Jesus loves you? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? And do you believe that Jesus gives you life? Even in the midst of the most craziest times, when life is messy and confusing and hard to understand. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself. And hopefully I'm speaking for my household as well. But we are going to choose to put our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to ask him to strengthen our faith for us to experience the life that he came to to give us. And when we have doubts and confusions, to know that he loves us. We want to thank you for worshiping with us online today. And I would just like to close with a a benediction. And before I do that benediction, I just want you to know if there's anything that you need, be sure to contact us at Silver Creek uh, Church of God. Um, You can use our email if you would like to make sure we get a message. You can use silvercreek at cog at gmail.com. That's silvercreekcog at gmail.com. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he grant you his countenance and his peace until we meet again. God bless you and have a great day.